Hi, everyone, and welcome to the New Human Movement. Today, Gary and I are delighted to be in conversation with Zeynep Ton. Zeynep Ton is a professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management and founder and president of the Good Jobs Institute. And back in 2014, Zeynep published a highly influential book called The Good Jobs Strategy. And, and the book draws on 15 years of highly practical on the ground uh, research to show that the best way you deliver great service, uh, higher shareholder returns and, and great jobs for people working in these organizations is to structure work environments in a way that elicits and harnesses employees' motivation and, and contribution. And at the Good Jobs Institute, Zeynep and her colleagues help businesses uh, create this kind of workplace alchemy. And you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic hitting frontline service workers far harder than any occupational group, Zeynep's work and, and perspectives on this topic couldn't be more relevant than they are today. So we are uh, truly delighted to have Zeynep with us today and, and welcome Zeynep and thanks uh, for, for being here. Thank you so much, Michele and Gary, and it's a pleasure to be with you. All right, it's our pleasure. So let me uh, maybe start with a basic question to, just to get us situated. How would you define a good job? So a good job is one where you meet people's basic needs, right? You pay them decent wages, offer them good benefits and stable schedules. So along with wages and schedules, they are able to put food on the table and have a decent life. A good job also means providing career paths so you can move up to a higher paid position and stay with the company and a stable and, and, and um, safe working environment. So these are the basic needs that every human being needs. But as we all know, a good job also offers the conditions for engagement and motivation. And those are related to, you know, we all want to do a good job. We want to have a sense of achievement. We want people to recognize the good work that we do. And we find the, we want to have a sense of belonging and find meaning in the work that we do. So a good job meets basic needs and offers the conditions for high you know, engagement and motivation by meeting the higher needs. Now, some might say that um, good jobs are in fixed supply, you know, that th there are only certain jobs that can be inherently good and other jobs are, you know, regrettably, uh, but inherently, inherently bad jobs. I mean, there's only so much uh, discretion that you can en engineer in a frontline service job and, and, and besides, most of the value gets created by, uh, you know, a few, a few jobs, uh, you know, staffed by uh, people with fancy degrees and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the ability to manipulate, uh, uh, you know, spreadsheets and, and, and program. And so how would you respond to, to, to those objections? Yeah, and I will mention two things that are inside this question, Michaela. The first one is what we value as a good job and um, not recognizing that 46 and a half million people in the United States worked in occupations where the median wage was less than $15 an hour. There are more service, low wage service jobs than manufacturing, technology, all of those combined. So, so to think that we are going to upskill our way to better jobs is just not a reality. Um, combined with the just the number of low wage jobs along with where the job growth is coming from. You know, when you look at the expected job growth in the next 10 years, the mo much of the mo job growth is coming from industries where, you know, the wages are low. Home care is the biggest occupation with, uh, uh, with job growth. So, so the first thing is we're focusing on the wrong problem when we say some jobs are inherent bad and we just need to put people into good jobs. So that's, I think, as a society, we need to figure out how to deal with that. And then the second thing is to, to, to think that those bad jobs have to be bad. I mean, even in the same industry, we often see companies providing very different job. In, in, in fact, you know, the differences within industries across companies tend to be even larger than across different industries. I'll give you an example. In the retail world, the median wage of a retail worker is a little bit less than $13 an hour. But at Costco, the median wage is over $25 an hour. Now, the interesting thing about Costco is that Costco is a low cost competitor. Right? They, don't fo they don't compete on the basis of differentiation. They don't put a red park carpet. Like They want to offer us, the customers, the lowest prices possible, yet they're able to do that by paying their employees 
almost double the median retail wages and have been a darling for their investors. So, so clearly you can provide good jobs even in an industry like low cost retail and you can provide it in lots of other settings where 46 and a half million people work right now. I was just wanna, I wanted to say one, one last thing I, and quote something that Zenfu wrote, which I think is so right and, and so underappreciated. You wrote recently that uh, job creators, you know, organizations, you know, need to reevaluate, and I'm quoting you here, need to reevaluate their assumptions about the jobs they create. It is easy to create a job that treats people like robots and justify it with the assumption that workers like skills and abilities. So I think you're making two very important points is one, this is a, a demand side issue as much as it a supply side issue, right? It's not just about people not having the skills. You can create work environments that elicit skills and develop skills. And the second, you're also alluding to the kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right, of this, because you create jobs that are not great jobs, and then people are not motivated, and they're, you know, not necessarily stretching themselves and so on, and people are led then to conclude, well, you know, you know, these people are, are, you know, are commodity people doing commodity work. And so like, we should just keep doing what we're doing. One of the most frequent questions I get when I present my research and people are convinced that you can design the work for high contribution and all these things. Um, but the, the question I get is, but are people worth $15 an hour or $20 an hour? And I think this deep assumption that people are not worth the that amount is 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 very problematic because one you know we have you know psychologists have talked about this this uh, fundamental attribution by uh, problem right we attribute the problem to the person versus the system that we create so in bad jobs companies here is what I have seen um, oftentimes the wages are so low schedules are so problematic that you operate with very high employee turnover. When, and you operate, and, and the, 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 the focus is on minimizing labor costs. So not only do you cut people's wages and benefits, but also you tend to have as few people as possible to get as much work as possible. So that underinvestment in people leads to both high employee turnover and understaffing. When you put these two together, the unit managers of these environments are constantly firefighting. They're firefighting because there are so many operational problems, customer problems that need to be solved. They're firefighting because people don't show up, um, because turnover is high, they need to hire new people, and they have no time. So when they don't have enough time, they hire the wrong person. They don't have enough time to train them. And then senior managers look at this environment and say, hey, you know, clearly our employees are not able. So let's remove all the decision making from them and they come and go. So we don't trust their ability. We don't trust their competence. Maybe they will deliberately make wrong decisions and they take empowerment away and they remove, you know, you know uh, and they put all these controls, which then creates environments where people make more mistakes. And sometimes, you know, I've seen so many examples of how headquarters mistakes decisions made no sense on the factory or on the selling floor or on the call centers. And when those decisions make no sense, what the front lines do, they either cut corners or they don't follow the process and, and, and they make errors. And when they don't follow the process, now the headquarters say, you know, we can't trust those people. So let's put even more control. So they get into this vicious cycle of low empowerment, poor ability, poor performance, and it's so hard to get out unless you change multiple things at the same time. So Zena, let me follow up there for a moment. I, I want to go back to Costco. Um, I remember, and I, I have to say, I think it was at least 20 years ago, 50 to 20 years ago, I remember reading a, a very deeply researched article in Business Week uh, that basically laid out Costco's employment practices versus Walmart's. And I, I won't have all the figures to hand now, but clearly Costco paid more. I want to say it was probably 20 to 30 percent more. Um, they offered more generous health care benefits. Uh, uh, but, but the flip side was they had single, single digit turnover, uh, while I think at that time Walmart's turnover was 25 or 30 percent a year. Uh, they had higher levels of customer loyalty because when I listen to you, you know, it all makes sense. And, and what I hear you saying is that 
companies that have seeked to maximize you know, hourly labor costs, often they're, they're chasing a false economy. And in doing so, they have poor customer service, they have more turnover, they have less loyalty. But, but, but this data has been there for a while. And, and, and you can see examples like Costco, like Southwest and others. What is, what is holding us back? What is, what is so difficult for executives to wrap their head around the fact that, 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 that this is a false economy, that in pursuing wage costs you know, at the expense of everything else, they end up impoverishing their business and impoverishing uh, customers and shareholders. Why? Why has this been? You know, why? Why are you still having to talk about this? Let me mention that Sam's Club, which is you know Walmart's Costco, Walmart's um, warehouse club, has been moving more into the good jobs model during the last couple of years. So Sam's Club made wage investments five to seven dollars an hour from a basis of fifteen dollars an hour. They've designed, they've started designing the work in a way that creates higher productivity and contribution. So, so Sam's, first of all, like, like there is some movement in the right direction, but your question about why is it that we're saying the same thing over and over again? I'm certainly not the first academic to say this. There have been, you know, decades of research that shows that investing in people and processes um, create high returns for shareholders, great customer service. And I think there are multiple problems, um, multiple reasons. One of them is because they don't have to. You know, we, we wrote a paper last year. Um, it came out in Organization Science where we showed that when it comes to short to medium term, you can maximize profits offering good jobs or bad jobs. You can do both. Um, so, so one reason is they don't have to. The second reason is that creating good jobs requires a system. Now, I mentioned in the bad job system, you know, how you have to hire and train the right people, empower them, design the work right, um, and, and, and lots of other things that goes into that system. That system is, requires managerial competence. That system requires systems thinking, and that is not the case uh, in many organizations. There are so many easier ways to grow sales or lower costs. I mean, in my work with retailing and, and outside retail too, I've seen executives focus so much on short-term fixes to sales. Let's add more products. Let's add more promotions. Let's buy another company. Let's let's do this. You know, th those are the easier things to do rather than fixing your system. So, so the systems view is is the second one. Um, and of course, when executives have short tenures, you know, why focus on the long-term harder things to do when there are easier easier ways and manual compensation is tied to this. But I will come back to what Michaela asked about people's assumptions. I think the biggest barrier is that a lot of executives don't believe in the frontline workers' ability to do a good job. They have convinced themselves that a lot of people don't go to work to do a good job because when they look at their organization, they see high absenteeism. They see uh, productivity problems. They see, um, they, they see behavioral issues. They see lots of, lots of problems and they convince themselves that most people don't want to do a good job and hence, why put ourselves in the hands of employees? Um, so when you look at a company like Costco, Jim Sinegal, who is Costco's founder and my business hero, he has a very different mindset about what drives people. And he thinks, I mean, he comes to my class every year and he tells my students, he says, 70 cents of every dollar that we spend goes to people. He says, everything else is only 30 cents. So 70 cents goes to people. And he says, if you don't do a good job managing people, this is a people business, you're gonna screw up your company. That's his mindset. And he says, so we believe, and he says, we've proven in this over and over, that if we invest in our people, good things will happen to us. But why does Jim have that belief? Because he's worked in the front lines for many years because he knows what the work is. He knows who the workers are. I think a lot of executives, sadly, have been so removed from that frontline employees and the work that they do that they can't have faith in them. Yeah, you know, a little bit, sometimes Michele and I, and I'm a little hesitant to say this, but sometimes we, we call this bureaucratic privilege, right? If, if you've kind of, you know, if you're a vice president or, and, and, you know, you've been to university, maybe you have a graduate degree, um, you know, it's easy to look at people on the front lines as, 
you know, kind of commodities. As we say, there's, you know, there's this mistaken assumption that, quote, commodity jobs are filled with, with commodity people. And, um, you know, we've interviewed for this series, we, we interviewed uh, John Ferriola, who's the uh, ex-retired uh, uh, now uh, CEO of Nucor. And I, and I want to pull up something because, the, you know, you said uh, uh, Costco is your hero. For us, Nucor has been a hero. Let me pull up something. This was, this was uh, Ken Iverson uh, writing, I suppose, uh, probably at least 60 years ago, but kind of talking about their philosophy there. And he said, inequality still runs rampant in most uh, businesses. He said, I'm referring now to hierarchical inequality, which legitimizes and institutionalizes the principles of we versus they, just as racial equality is once legitimized and institutionalized. So, so I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that kind of resonates with you, but I think, you know, when you see these enormous salary differentials of 200, 300, 400, 1 between the top of the organization and frontline workers, it's a little hard to actually believe that those people can add a lot of business value. So when you're working with, with your clients and companies, uh, Zenyev, how do you, how do you start to shift that kind of, um, I don't know, that, that kind of arrogance, if I can say it, or that tendency to look at, you know, less credentialed people as simply factors of production. How, how do you get that, that kind of personal epiphany that sees, those, that, that sees the inherent or the latent capabilities in those people? Yeah, and it's not easy, Gary. I mean, it's not easy. I think one way to do that is by encouraging them to spend a lot of time in the front lines and encouraging them to see what the work is and what happens to workers. Uh, I think the other discrepancy is that a lot of executives have no idea what low wages do to people. They have no idea. I mean, we work with an organization where senior leaders were talking about um, benefits. They had high turnover problem. And they were thinking about, and, and this was in assisted living, senior living facilities where people were making close to minimum wage. They were operating with, again, high, high employee turnover, attendance problems. Most people that we interviewed had more than one job because one job you know, at $13 an hour wasn't enough to take care of their families. And in one of the meetings, there was a discussion about whether discounts on ski lift tickets would be a good benefit. Now, if they've spent any time with their employees, maybe have gone to their homes, they would know that they don't go skiing. They, they have trouble putting food on the table. They have trouble finding care for their children. So I think the, the discrepancy is so deep, both in terms of what the work is and what the headquarters decisions do to the work itself, but also what low pay does to workers. And now there's tremendous research that shows that, you know, when people don't have enough incomes, their physical and mental health suffers even their cognitive capacity suffers. I mean, when, when they're constantly thinking about money, their IQ drops 13 points because they, don't, they, they have that scarcity. Um, they're constantly thinking about, do I put food on the table or pay for rent or, or, or pay for this, this, this term? And of course, when you're in that environment, it's very hard to focus on your job and it's very hard to um, attend and it's very hard to get promoted. And workers tend to end in this vicious cycle of poverty where low pay drives, you know, poor mental, physical, cognitive health that drives poor performance. And then they're stuck in this poverty cycle. So I think one of the things that executives also need to do a better job is understanding that poverty cycle that their workers are in and say, what can we do? Um, and you don't have to be a genius to figure out what you can do, like pay them more offer a work environment where people can bring their true selves and they can create high productivity and high contribution. Um, but our system is not designed to encourage those leaders to do that currently. Yeah, because, you know, in a way it's, it's frustrating, it's disappointing because, um, you know, you're, you're saying that even the basics we need to attend to, right? That, uh, people are stuck in low-wage jobs, no chance to get ahead. They're, 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 they're consumed with simply putting food on the table, and that creates a cascade of other kinds of social, social problems. And as you said, you know, 46 and a half million people uh, in the United States, you can multiply that across other developed economies. 
I guess let me ask let me ask uh, uh, another question. So you 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 said the first step is to become aware of that to become sensitive. I think in 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 a sense to be a, a, a kind of empathetic uh, uh, to that. But what is the first step, right? Let's say that I, I have that awareness. Let's say that I believe you. I've accepted the fact that there is a payoff here for everybody. This is a win-win. What's the first step as an enlightened leader to start to, you know, move out? Do I do I simply raise salaries by frontline salaries by fifteen or twenty percent and hope? Do I start by working on the culture? What's what's kind of the sequence of things that an organization does? to turn on that capability and 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 create uh, more opportunity. Yeah, so um, when we work with organizations, the first step is to look at the data and to diagnose the problems that you have within your organization. So when I talk about good job strategy, it's partly investing in workers, which is higher pay, more benefits, etc. But then there are operational choices that leverage that investment. So you must make both the investment in people and those operational choices. And there are four choices that I talk about. One of them is uh, focus and simplify. So be very clear about what value you, you add your customers and simplify operationally. The second one is a combination of standardization and empowerment. So standardize so we don't have to use our mental capacity to do things that are very routine and we are empowered to re improve our work and make decisions for customers. The third decision is uh, cross train. And then the, the, the last one is staff properly. I call this operate with Slack. So one thing is to recognize, you know, there are four operational choices and investment in people. So where do you start when you have decided, okay, this good job strategy would work in my organization if I implemented it. Um, and these four choices and investment in people, by the way, are interrelated. Right, so, so you can't empower your employees if you have high turnover, right? If you can't empower your employees if they are wasting their time doing tedious tasks. So where we have found the most important leverage points are in the beginning um, tend to be related to investing in people and focusing and simplifying. Those lay the foundations. So investing in people, every organization we work with, we have them look at the data. What's your turnover? What percentage of your managers have been promoted from within? If that number is not, you know, over 90%, it means you're not investing in developing your people. And then the third thing that we look at is pay data, not hourly wages, but take home pay, either on a monthly or yearly basis. So we share when we run workshops with organizations, we have them present their data on pay distribution and what percentage of their full-time employees are making a living wage. And when they sh present those data, there's quietness in the room. Because once you see those data, PayPal CEO um, said this so well, he said, once you see those data, you can't unsee it. Like you see the situation that your, your workers are in. So, so the first lever tends to be look at those data and see what wage commitments can you make. You know, how, how high can you go? Uh, Sam's Club, I mentioned, made 5 to $7 an hour of wage investments for tens of thousands of people in their, in their warehouses. Now, if you operate in an environment with very small profit margins, these investments are very expensive investments at first, right? So what these companies tend to do, and a good, good starting point is combine that wage or employee investment um, along with operational choices to raise productivity. So almost every company we work with, there's too much complexity. People are wasting their time doing tedious tasks. What, 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 they what are, are the examples? Sorry to interrupt. I'll what, give you an example about, of complexity. You, you talked about simplicity and standardizing. Can you give us an example or two practically yes. of, of where, you know, how, how that works? Yes, I'll, I'll give you an example from Sam's Club because they've done this, you know, looking at the good job strategy. One of the things they said was, what value do, you, do we offer our customers? Why do our members come to us? And the reason was, you know, they, they pay to shop at Sam's Club and we need to offer them the lowest prices. Well, lowest prices means that we can't offer them a lot of products. So they simplify their product line. They reduce product variety by 25%, which is exactly what I have seen in good jobs companies. And the CEO of Sam's Club at the time, John Ferner, he told my students, he said, the, the funniest thing happened when we reduced our variety. 
Um, first, of course, our people are now more productive, right? They can work faster. They're more knowledgeable about the products. They can process customers faster. They can shelf faster. But he said, our customers said that they were happier about the assortment now because now they can find the things. Everything is in stock and, you know, you, you removed that clutter for the customer and now they can see what you're presenting. So reducing variety is one example of simplifying. Um, and, and it's an example that works in a wide, wide range of settings. Empowering people. I mean, there are numerous examples, but how many times have you gone to a place where people will say, I have to ask my supervisor for help, right? I, I went to Whole Foods a couple of years ago. Um, I, I had both um, their bags, the recyclable bags, which broke after the first use. It was a Saturday. I was shopping at Whole Foods and I asked, could you return? Can I, you know, could you replace this? It's just a $3 bag. The cashier said, I have to ask my supervisor for help. Now it's a $3 bag. It was a Saturday. There was a long list of customers and my time was wasted. Those customers' time was wasted. They couldn't sell as much. And of course the supervisor came and there was this whole process. So that's an example of lack of empowerment. What Costco would do is they would tell their frontline employees, make a decision up to this amount of money. You don't have to ask for help. We trust you. You're going to make a good decision. So, so those are some of the examples where, you know, these types of decisions leverage your investment in people and increase their productivity. You know, one thing, one thing you didn't mention, uh, 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 or, or, or perhaps I missed it, was actually investing in the business skills of those frontline employees. You know, that, that one of the things in our research we've seen is, is the companies that have really turned on that frontline capability that are able to pay more, uh, that, that have confidence in empowering their people. They spend a lot of time teaching people on the front lines how to think like business people, right? What's a P&L? What's return on assets? What's, what's a, a net promoter score? And, they, and they, they, they share intensively that kind of business data with people because it, it seems to us that so often the tendency has been, let me move decisions up to where perhaps people have competence rather than no, let me, let me push the competence down to the people who have context, who are working right there every day with, with customers. So do you see that also in some of the good jobs companies that they are more, more, more thoughtful and, and, and taking the time to upgrade the skills of the people on the front lines? No, well, absolutely. I'll give you an example outside Costco because we talked a lot about Costco. But Mercadona is Spain's largest supermarket chain. And it's one of the companies that I talk about in my book. Um, every single day, Mercadona's store managers will go to each department, let's say uh, fruit and vegetables or meat or, 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 or uh, fish department, and talk to the owners, the, the, the specialists in that department, about performance the day before. They'll talk about what did we sell? What were we supposed to sell? Why, you know, what can we do to increase our sales? They'll talk about shrink, which is a very important measure for them. Um, what happened? How many kilos of tomatoes went to spoilage yesterday? Why? What could we do better? So they are constantly thinking about improving performance. They know what the most important levers are. Oftentimes, the most important has to do with the customer, right? They start with the sales, those numbers. And, 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 and you know what the most important thing is. Um, and there is a you know, small huddle within each group and you constantly think about how to improve that performance. Now at bad jobs companies, Gary, none of this happens because managers, I mean, I have a quote from a supermarket, I, I'm working on my second book right now, but I have a quote from a supermarket um, store manager who is managing a $25 million operation and he talks about how he says I had no time for improvement I had no time for thinking about improving performance because I'm constantly working at the cash register because I don't have enough people or I am fixing equipment problems I'm fixing customer problems I have no time to hire I have no time to lead people and I have no time to improve. I had a million ideas to improve. I couldn't do any of them. So bad jobs companies operate in that chaos constantly. And then the good jobs, because things are smooth, because employee turnover is low, people show up, work is simplified. So there's a nice flow. 
you can focus on improving the business and you know what those levers are because this company has also invested in your training. Um, of course, internal promotion helps with all this as well. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. Hire is the world's leading appliance company and also a global leader in the Internet of Things. For the last decade, Hire has been leading a remarkable revolution in management. It has proven that even the largest, most complex organizations in the world can be entrepreneurial at their core. Now, back to our conversation. Zeynep, I wanted to go back to the point you were making about the PayPal CEO saying, you know, once you see something, you can't unsee it. And, and the, the shock value that comes from just holding a mirror in front of these companies and saying, this is your full workforce and this is what it's, you know, how they're, how they're struggling. And, and this is in a way like the cost, right? Because you mentioned that you show them turnover data. And I would imagine that they understand, they can do a few numbers and understand that, you know, between recruitment and training and so on, if you're just operating a high turnover, that, 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 that's a cost, right? That, that you're not maybe seeing as much. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what are ways to show executives and other people in positions of power who'd have to say, yeah, let's make this pivot that, you know, there is, you know, the, the cost is unsustainable, right? And it's, it's, it's a human cost, but also the productivity cost, right? Because, and I would just say the last thing and I'll let you answer. Because part, part, part of the problem is that those who are trying to create better work environments are, are fighting in kind of on an unequal playing field where you, you, there are lots of metrics to gauge efficiency of a business and not so many metrics to gauge, you know, the lost initiative or customer satisfaction that comes from centralizing and standardizing excessively and, and taking away that responsibility from, from you know, that cashier at Whole Foods who had to kind of hold everybody up in line as they were seeking what to do with, you know, advice from the from their supervisor on, on your bag. So like, do you have a sense of like, do we need to develop new metrics? Do we need to train people and in, in, in educate executives around an existing set of metrics that they're just not as aware of? I mean, what, what do we need to do to create that fact base that that will propel more people into action? Yeah, I think tools and metrics could certainly help. So at Good Jobs Institute, we've developed a Good Jobs Calculator, um, and this is in um, with National Association of Convenience Stores. So we have, when we work with companies, we quantify the cost of their bad job system. And part of those costs have to do with lost sales, which tends to be actually the biggest cost. You know, oftentimes people think about you know, employee turnover cost as the only one, but where the biggest lever tends to be is what you, you know, what you can't sell because you're operating in the system. And then the other chunk is um, costs, shrink, uh, turnover costs, et cetera, overtime costs, um, et cetera. And then the third bucket is labor productivity gains that you could have. So, so we've created these, this financial tool that could be used um, and, and, and have used it with certain companies. But I will say one thing, which is, for a lot of executives that are short-term focused, an easy a, a reaction is there are faster and easier ways that I can use my investment to create a return. So financial, so so they believe the, they they believe like I, I haven't yet worked with a company where they don't believe in these costs, but not all of them have moved to the good job strategy. So, so one of the reasons is I think they, they say there are some easier ways. So where I have seen companies move, Michele, is where the leadership said competitively, we have to do this. The reason Walmart and Sam's Club moved is, is moving to this model is because they have huge same store sales growth decline. They were losing their customers. They had to compete against another company. So uh, Amazon emerged. So they said to stay in business, to win with our customers, we have to do this. Another bunch of organizations like PayPal, they did this because they found it morally wrong to operate the, the, the way that they were operated. So I think the, the competitive and moral reasons tend to dominate the financial reasons for moving into this direction, but you have to justify financially. Having said this, there could be outside influences to encourage companies to move this way. For example, if BlackRock said, you have to disclose your pay data, 
You have to disclose your employee turnover data. You have to disclose your data about internal promotion. Now the companies, you know, the CEOs will have to start paying attention to those because they have to disclose it. So, so I think there's huge benefit of getting these companies to disclose these types of data so we can see the real costs um, and, and, and they could be moving in that direction. But internally, I've, I have found, at least with the companies that I have engaged with, the competitive and moral reasons to dominate more. Yeah. Can I ask you another question related to this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Zainab? And, 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 you know, the, uh, I think I love your point about disclosures and metrics. And in, in a way, it's partly a, a game of uh, honor and shaming, right? And, 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 and also informing customers and employees about, you know, where they might want to, you know, move their business or their employment hours, right, uh, towards certain companies versus others. So I think that's really, really promising. Yep. And but companies I wonder, love benchmarking, right? I mean, they right. love benchmarking. They right. love, like... So my, my question was also how much of this, not, not to get too philosophical, but how much of this is also just like, it reflects the, almost like an ideological belief in, in a lot of these executives, and maybe they get this at business schools or, or somewhere else, that you can actually manage a, re, you know, a retail operation, but maybe more broadly, other, other kinds of companies, you can manage them from the center because you have the information, the expertise, you actually, yeah, maybe people can be a little bit more productive and we can empower them and so on. But to be honest, the real leverage comes from getting things figured out at the center. And, and I'm just reminded here of, I forget exactly the author of this report, but she was looking in the UK, she was looking at the uh, shrieking scope of uh, discretion in retail operations. And she was mentioning that some stores can't even turn their lights off. You know, they're, they're turned off by like some person at HQ. And that every like, you know, meat and other thing, other packages all come already done. And that the goal of, of people at the center was to make like jobs as lazy as possible at the front lines, because like, and, and so some people might just say, you know, th that's really where the leverage is. And I think you would disagree with that, that no, you're actually underestimating all this loss initiative and, and so on. But, but it seems to me that partly it is, uh, kind of a mental model that they have about the world and how it works that is uh you know we we just need to demolish somehow or or or, or try to push against yeah and they do end up a bunch of stupid decisions i mean it's if we were analyzing yeah. one retailer they were selling yankees gear in boston now i'm from <laughs> turkey i don't know baseball but i know that yankees gear is not gonna sell here unless it's like toilet paper or something so 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 they do end up making lots of stupid decisions that that don't work but i think what they think is we can still manage from the top that lack of humility is so prevalent and again profits can hide lots of sins you can still be profitable making these bad decisions especially if you have gotten bid big and customers have no choice but shop at you customers have no sh no choice but come to your services right uh, so so i think the fact that these organizations continue to be profitable Yeah, you know, then, let me let me underline something you said earlier from my own experience, and then and then ask a question. Um, you know, you said earlier that that making this change, it's not just a matter of of one variable. It's not simply you know raising raising uh, uh, people's pay, but it's a system problem, right? It's a change in expectation. It is simplifying. Uh, it is it is putting in you know it is empowering people. And my experience says leaders really don't like to make system change. They don't, you know, they're looking for, for the silver bullet. You know, I, I spent a lot of my life trying to help organizations be more systematic about innovation and thinking about how do you invest in it, build the capabilities, support it, experimentation. And, and when you really ask executives to think systematically about anything, it's a struggle. So I do think, you know, that I, I understand that resistance because it is a complex problem. It is multidimensional. And that means that you have to stick at it for a while. It's, it's kind of not the one and done. So I, I appreciate the fact that often, as you were saying, only when you kind of run out of other options and, and, and you're up against a new competitor or you're losing traction with customers that you finally, finally have to do this. But I think the other thing we were talking about a, mo a moment ago that's so important is 
you know, we haven't had the, 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 the measurement systems. And let, let me explain for a moment. While, while you can see excess turnover and uh, having to retrain people, I think the biggest benefit of, of, of the kind of, of work environment you're creating is when you turn on the imagination of people there and they start to innovate. They start to improve your business. You know, we've, we've looked at this data in Toyota and it's, a, and it's a little bit hard to get at, but, but, but Toyota's employees make somewhere between a million and two million suggestions uh, for improvement every year. This is, this is what drives Toyota is the imaginative capacity of those employees. And if, if you've never turned that on, if you haven't seen what it looks like when everybody is showing up every day saying, how do we build a better business here? You, 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 you simply can't, you know, j just, just like there's certain things you can't unsee, well, there's certain things you can't imagine if you've never seen them. And I think that's also a, a challenge for a lot of these leaders. They've never seen a workforce where people show up excited, turned on, experimenting, thinking, and, 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 and it's hard. So I wonder how much of this in your work are you taking leaders and you're taking them into these other organizations and you're helping them to see what, what this looks like when people really are alive every day at work and, and contributing this way? Because I think for a lot of us, they, they, they've just never seen an organization that looks like that. Yeah, and yeah, you know, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm a huge Toyota fan. I mean, I'm an operations person. So of course I grew up uh, studying Toyota. And uh, on our advisory board, we have someone from Toyota at Good Jobs Institute, and we work with him very closely. So he has implemented, he has helped implement Toyota production system in a wide range of settings. Uh, so we work with them closely. So um, we do have him involved in, in some of these conversations. We do provide examples from Costco, from others, where you can bring in that imagination of, of, of front lines to make decisions. But where I think it is most impactful is when they make this decision and they try it and they see it working. So Quest Diagnostics was one of the first companies that implemented the good job strategy in their call centers. And they, they started with paying people more, they started with clear career paths, they started with simplifying by removing some of those calls that were not needed. That's what helped make them the, the wage investments. But as they stabilized their people and operations, as they brought down the turnover, now they could bet on their people and they could create improvement programs. And they said, we're going to try it at two different pods. Their, their call centers were divided into pods. And they said, we're going to divide it into two different pods. And to figure out which pods we're going to work with, we're going to ask the supervisors to give us a five minute presentation. And they thought, oh, is anybody want to going to do this? Maybe they want to be excited. When the supervisors made the presentation, there were literally tears among the executives. And they said, I didn't know they had it in them. And Marianne Camacho, this, this leader who implemented this, she said, you see, you ask people to come to the table and they shine. So, and then within a, I think 12, I, I, had, I have the numbers wrong now, but within a period, they had 1,500, over 1,500 ideas from the front lines. They implemented 1,001 of them, and they saved $1.3 million. Of course, to, to get there, they had to first stabilize. You can't, it's, it's hard to start with empowering people when you don't have a stable system, but they saw the power of this. But you know what happened? Everything improved in this organization. Their employee turnover um, went from 36% to something like 16%. Their calls that were answered within 60 seconds um, increased dramatically. Transfer rates declined. They ended up saving money, even though they invested more in their people. And you would think that everywhere at Quest Diagnostics, people would say, hey, now I want to implement this in logistics. Now I want to Im implement this in service centers. But that wasn't the case. So that, I mean, this is what amazes me is that even in, within the same organization, unless you have the leader who believes in this, it's very hard to do it, which leads me to think that we can't just rely on leaders alone for, for creating good jobs in this yeah, country. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you talk about, well, there's, there's two things there. Again, let me underline something and then a question. Because, you know, we, we talked about the importance of data, but then you, you also talked about getting what is almost like a heart conversion. And certainly, you know, my experience has been that 
you know, there's only so far any leader will go in doing something difficult driven by data alone, even if the data is quite compelling. At some point, that conviction has to move from mind to heart. And, and you have to believe that this is fundamentally the right thing to do, uh, not only the profitable thing to do. And, 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 if, and if, you don't, if you don't make that, 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 that uh, kind of jump from head to heart, I worry that you know, you'll, you'll, you'll maybe do this superficially or you won't stick at it and you won't keep working at it. And, and I, I don't know if that's your, your experience. But you know, in your writing, you talk about the fact, as you just said, that you know, for whatever reason, we've talked about some of them, that you know, we may not be able to just leave this up to the, uh, you know, to every leader at every company to do this. That somehow we have to perhaps pressurize the system from outside in the same way that's happened over environment, over diversity. What does that look like to you? How do we, you know, wh whether it's government, whether it's us as consumers, how do we kind of pressurize, uh, if you like, leaders to, uh, to do what, what clearly makes sense, but when they may not be inclined to do it? So what levers can we pull to encourage more companies to adapt th these, uh, these strategies? I think every stakeholder has to do their parts. Um, investors, especially ESG investors who are so, you know, I interested in the environmental, social and governance related things need to ask for data that really matters for people. So for employees, take on pay data, internal promotion data, turnover data, you know, these are the hard things that may be, you know, hard, hard data points perhaps, but very important for the employee experience. On the government side, policies to encourage more companies to adapt this, higher minimum wages, stable scheduling laws that are done in relations with, with, with companies so that they work for workers and, 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 and for customers as well. Um, paid sick leave. I mean, it's amazing how in this country we don't have paid sick leave for, for frontline employees and they come up and they show up at work sick, even in restaurants and in health, you know, assisted living facilities um, and, you know, helping them with their children in terms of, you know, ch child care. So I think the government can do a lot in, in encouraging more companies to adapt this. And one big lever that I think that's not used is tax incentives. I mean, right now, we encourage companies to invest in technology and in automation because we give them te tax incentives. Why not do that for wages, for, for, for employee investments, um, so that companies don't implement what my colleague at MIT calls so-so technologies, uh, but really focus on their workers. On the business education side, we can do a lot of things. I mean, we talked about how one of the reasons that we don't see many companies doing this is because executives don't think in systems. Well, to our MBA students, we don't teach them how to think in systems. MBA education has been more specialized and more specialized. I've been in this field for 20 years during my 20 year tenure. And I think that's a problem. And, and we also need to teach our students how to, what it means to run a successful business. I had the privilege of working at two different schools, um, Harvard Business School and MIT Sloan. You know, at HBS, the mission was to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. At MIT Sloan, it's to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world. Well, is that what we teach in our curriculum? Not really. So I think that will, be, that will be a step in the right direction. And then of course, customers can vote with their wallets, um, especially given that you don't have to pay higher prices to, to, to buy from good jobs companies. People are oftentimes surprised to find how much Trader Joe's or, or Costco pays their workers compared to others. Um, and and, and, it, and if, if, if we are more cognizant about the, you know, care about the employees as much as we care about some environmental or other factors, that could be a driving force as well. But I think at the end, we need to think about how do we change people's assumptions about people? And I don't have a great answer to that. And that is not a new problem either. I mean, when we, we recently wrote a note with um, my Good Jobs Institute felt um, executive director Sarah Kellogg and, 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 and Amanda Silver uh, about low skill. Where did this idea of low skill come from? Like, why did we start categorizing 
jobs at low skill, and it came from early 1900s, and it was done because they thought, we're, we already classify people, why don't we classify work too? And they classified some work into this low skill category, and that category had factory workers initially, you know, before it, it had slaves, uh, but, but the agricultural workers, construction workers, service workers, and not surprisingly, people who worked in, this, in these categories of low skill were either immigrants or African Americans or women or children. So, so I think there's something that we have to do about, you know, who are these workers and what do they do and how do we treat them with respect and dignity that we need to figure out as a society. Well, certainly we, we know, and we've talked about this data before in our series here. I mean, we know that a, a majority of people today don't believe the system is working for them, however you define the system. And, and, and they do believe that, you know, the elite are out of touch, that they don't understand their lives and the struggles, and, and you're calling us to be more aware of that. I think also, we, you know, we, wrote, we, we have quite a bit to say about that in our book because we came to the same conclusion you do. How in the world do we, you know, why do we talk about something as a low-skilled job? There is no job that is inherently low-skilled. Now, you can drain the skill out of it if you choose to, but there's no job that's inherently low-skilled. So I, th I think we have common cause there. Let me, let me though, let me, let me ask you how do you re you'd respond to one challenge, though. Because what you might hear, and I've certainly, I've had this, this kind of pushback. If you look at retail as a sector, and, you've, and a lot of your examples, a lot of your workers in retail, retail is mostly protected from global competition. Uh, you know, that's, it's a local business. You walk into a Sam's Club or a Costco or, a, or, 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 or Trader Joe's. Now, if you look at what's happened, and, and I won't pull the data up here, but if you look at the sectors in the U.S. economy that have been most exposed to global competition, particularly competition from China, you've seen substantial job losses, 40% of manufacturing jobs disappearing over a couple of decades. And so what is going to prevent companies from which, which they've been doing is, is wage arbitrage. You know, it's, it's very hard to find something at Walmart other than food products that wasn't made in China. So, so is this, do, do you see this as a strategy primarily in, in, in person service jobs that have been protected from global competition? Or is there a way in, in other industries to use a good job strategy to kind of claw back some of these lost jobs that have disappeared as, as companies have uh, moved them offshore? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there, there are a bunch of different questions there, Gary, but one of them is the shrinking of manufacturing jobs. And it's not that manufacturing, and, and there are two issues there, because the manufacturing output has not declined in the United States, uh, but the number of jobs has declined, and, and, and partly because of the offshoring, but partly because of automation um, as well. But hopefully, um, the pandemic and the failure to supply critical components, PPE, is making us rethink about manufacturing strategy and, 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 and the importance of doing some of the things at home here. Um, and, and, and that could be one silver lining of, 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 I think, this pandemic. So I'm hopeful that we will see more manufacturing jobs in the United States. Um, and in the manufacturing field, some of the companies that adopted the Toyota production system did so because they wanted to compete against those low-cost suppliers from other places. So again, competition can also be a force for, um, force for moving companies in, in, into this, uh, this direction. Well, then you've been you've been so helpful, and I and I want to recommend uh, people to your work. You'll 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 find uh, Zinip's uh, books online in all the usual places. You can follow her research. Um, you know, the 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 thing that I take away from all of this is that this is a win win. That this either or thinking of you know it's either paying workers a decent wage and empowering them, or it's profitability is just a stupid way to think about it. So I, I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing to raise attention around this issue, the fact that you're working on it in a systemic way, and we just encourage all of our viewers, our listeners, to get acquainted with your work, go deeper, and make sure that your, your organization is a good jobs organization. So uh, th thank you a ton for being with us.
Uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the work that you are doing as well.